There are new facts concerning Nixon, Watergate, the death of Dorothy Hunt, the wife of E. Howard Hunt, in a new book by St. John Hunt, the eldest son of convicted Watergate burglar, CIA super spy, and Nixon employee E. Howard Hunt. This is an incredible book. The uh, title of the memoir, Dorothy, the murder of E. Howard Hunt's wife, Watergate's darkest secret. I got to tell you, it's uh, compelling. It's good to have you on the show, Saint. Thanks so much, Alan, for having me. And uh, I want to thank your listeners for uh, tuning in and for supporting you as much as they do. It's uh, people like you that uh, really uh, uh, have the weight of... uh, of the uh, of, of the continuation of the truth in media on your shoulders, and I, I respect that you carry that burden with elegance and uh, and uh, fierceness. Well, I appreciate that very much. I it, it, this is amazing in so many ways because you were there, and and the fact that it, a lot almost all this information was not even known until you brought this out. So we'll talk about that. But let's just start about, let's just give a little background to you as a teenager and what was going on in your life and what you knew and what you didn't know. Well, um, up until the time I was 16, I I was fairly used to uh, uh, a gypsy-like existence. We moved uh, every two or three years uh, uh, to uh, various locations around the world, uh, an example would be uh, Japan, uh, and then uh, Montevideo, Uruguay, and then Mexico City, and France, Spain, uh, the USA, and so um, I was uh, I was used to all that. I, matter of fact, I thought that didn't everybody else move around all the time like that? Um, but when I was 16, my parents uh, uh, called me in and sat me down in the living room of our house in Potomac and uh, explained to me that uh, <clears throat> that my father. Um, uh, had not been working for the State Department uh, this entire time uh, over the last years and years, but in fact had been uh, an operative of the CIA. And at, I was 16, the CIA, I didn't really, hadn't really heard of it too much and really didn't mean anything to me. Um, it didn't change anything, certainly. Um, it didn't clarify anything. But um, within a year or so, the, the understanding of the CIA came full bore uh, down uh, uh, around my reality, and I was um, thrust into this position uh, uh, to help my father uh, during the uh, first uh, three or four days after his entry team was uh, arrested at the Democratic National Convention headquarters in Washington, D.C. Uh, I uh, transferred large amounts of cash um, from banks uh, being followed by uh, FBI or whomever, uh, to, and I transferred them to our home in Potomac and hid them in a prearranged uh, designated area that my father had built into the walls or the ceiling. And uh, I also destroyed uh, other evidence, typewriters that had been used to uh, forge the uh, famous DM cables, which uh, Nixon uh, wanted uh, my father to uh, forge some cables that implicated John F. Kennedy in the assassination of Vietnamese President DM. Wow. And, uh, the deal was... Uh, my, Life magazine was on the hook, and it, this this whole thing was going to be exposed. I guess making JFK look bad and making Nixon look great. But this is um, this is the kind of stuff my father was involved in. Um, <clears throat> in those later years, it was primarily uh, media related uh, work for the agency. Uh, people at that time didn't realize that the CIA had in place <clears throat> hundreds of operatives uh, that that had. Uh, varying positions within media, uh, Time Magazine, Newsweek, various uh, ABC, NBC, CBS, Mm -hmm. and certainly in every major city around the world and this country, they had in place uh, uh, someone uh, in authority that could uh, either prevent or or support uh, a news item that, uh, that might make the CIA look good or bad. Of course, if it was something that made the CIA or the government look bad, then that person in that position would then spin it so that uh, it didn't get the the, uh, the right airplay, or maybe it never even uh, was uh, was shown on on television or broadcast over the radio. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think under questioning, um, uh, uh, either uh, the CIA director Dick Helms or the one uh, after him, um, I can't remember his name off the top of my head. They admitted to having hundreds and hundreds, up to seven hundred. CIA uh, uh, contract agents working in media to control the media. 
and uh, you know, but uh, yeah. And so at 16, I learned my parents, my dad was CIA. It wasn't until years later that I learned that my mom had been in OSS and CIA as well. And that is another fascinating part of this uh, uh, this this new book. Your mother and her relationship with uh, Nixon and the mysterious death, the uh, the crash of that airplane. What a story! If you could give us the uh, the, the groundwork on that. Well, sure. Um, at the height of Watergate, there was a war uh, going on between uh, my mother, my father, and uh, the Nixon White House, and that war centered on um, the demands that my father was and mother were making. Um, uh, to uh, for the Nixon people to supply uh, large amounts of cash to the defendants, the four Cubans who were arrested uh, at, at the DNC that night, my father as well, Gordon Liddy's family, uh, James McCord's family did not want any of the of the of the support money. Now we called it support money. The people at the White House called it blackmail money. Nixon, on the other hand, um, felt uh, um, that he could fully. Um, Engage in this uh, in this money for silence, and he was prepared to um, to uh, pay my father uh, a million dollars or more. And on the uh, White House tapes, certain tapes, he can be heard as saying, uh, uh, "He's asking John Dean, well, uh, what would it, what do you think it would take to keep Howard Hunt, you know, quiet?" And Dean just grabbed the figure in the air. He says in his book, uh, he goes, "I don't know, a million dollars, maybe more." And Nixon immediately is, "Oh." A million dollars? I can get a million dollars. I know where we can get a million dollars. It's important to keep Hunt quiet. You open up that scab, it's going to make a lot of people look bad. It's going to make the CIA look bad. It's going to make me look bad. It's going to make Hunt look bad. And Dean and Ehrlichman and Haldeman, his top uh, uh, you know, counsels at the White House, did not understand <clears throat> what the hold my father had on Nixon and, and what, what, what it was that Nixon was afraid that Hunt would speak about. And uh, uh, during the height of, of Watergate, and uh, towards the end of 1972, in December specifically, um, it, w- it was all coming to a head. Now, this is before Bob Woodward and Paul Bernstein wrote their book on uh, on the Watergate, All the President's Men. Mm-hmm. And my mother and father had uh, sent uh, uh, explicit threats to Nixon via um, the channels that they had been given to to, uh, to, con- to communicate to the White House, saying that they were prepared to blow Nixon and the White House completely out of the water, that they had information, they had memos, they had evidence, not only of Nixon's um, uh, involvement in, in, in the Watergate break-in, but of many, many other illegal and felonious activities that Nixon approved of that had yet to be uh, discovered or mm-hmm. unearthed. And this was a this was a very scary thing for for President Nixon, even though he was uh, number one in the uh, you know popular vote. Uh, the uh, evidence my father had of Nixon's approval of the assassination attempts against Castro back in '60 and '59, uh, Nixon felt could have ruined his uh, political career, impeached him, or maybe even uh, you know certainly disgraced him. And um, and that's one of the things that my parents had against Nixon was the fact that he was uh, he he was the White House liaison and gave his full approval uh, on a secret project to assassinate Castro's brother Raúl Che Guevara and various other heads of state in Cuba, but not only that, heads of state in other countries such as the Congo, such as Chile. Uh, Nixon approved of Operation 40, which was a CIA-trained group of Cuban assassins mm-hmm. that were trained in in assassination, interrogation, uh, extreme interrogation, not just interrogation, but extreme interrogation. And uh, and they went off and running. And when Kennedy found out about this, <clears throat> uh, he uh, it's been quoted as him saying, uh, "We've got a goddamn murder incorporated running amok in the in the Caribbean, in the Caribbean." Yeah, uh, wow. and uh, you know he and his uh, attorney general brother Bobby uh, immediately tried to put a stop to this uh, this assassination team that was floating around, uh, killing at will whoever the CIA deemed was you know should be knocked off. And my father was part of that uh, that team. He uh, he arranged some of the, the persons. He trained some of the persons, and uh, and Nixon. Uh, 
approved of all of this, and very few people knew that Nixon was involved in that. And that's what Nixon feared for my father, as well as the fact that they had evidence that the the uh, financial backing for the Watergate break-in and uh, the other illegal activities that came out of the White House during that period were financed by uh, the committee to re-elect the president, which was Nixon's, uh, you know, his, uh, his, his uh, election uh, slush fund, his, his big war chest of money mm-hmm. to get him elected. And they had proof that the that the cash was laundered through a Mexican bank and, you know, and then sent back. And, and uh, Nixon was... Uh, yeah, do you, you know, anybody that threatens the president of the United States by revealing something that's documented, that's uh, not going to turn out well for uh, for the for the people doing this. Yeah. And it didn't turn out well for my, my parents at all. <laughs> and your father, when he was working for Nixon, he was, he, he was on the surface very loyal to him. They had a good relationship, but yet nixon was suspicious because he knew how much your father knew and he just he was afraid yeah what, what was the relationship like when he was hiding all these secrets well you know my, my father <clears throat> richard nixon i'm sorry i, I have a, a scratchy throat i i um i've been up for two days uh, uh taking a bus from northern california down to san francisco and then waiting at the airport for a flight across the country. Oh, I and flying. I know that throat feeling from traveling. <laughs> yeah, I, I've yeah, had it. Yeah, it's dry air on the plane. It just, it just, uh, I you know, understand. I appreciate what you, yeah, you're you coming I, across. I came to Fort Lauderdale at 7 this morning and, uh, you know, basically just barely unpacked. And, but I'm, I'm so happy to be here with you. Oh, man, uh, very cool. You're doing you're doing fine and just uh, yeah, continue there with their relationship. Yeah, my, I don't want to talk about your mom. My father's relationship with Richard Nixon dates back to uh, the early 50s. When Nixon, uh, as um, uh, as a Senator Nixon, actually uh, met my father, and uh, uh, they were at a restaurant, and my father noticed that, uh, that Richard Nixon was there, and he went over and congratulated him on his work on the Alger Hiss case. And Nixon turned around and looked at my father, and and uh, you know they they exchanged a few words. But then later on, in uh, in the mid fifties, they met again, and uh, when Nixon was vice president under Eisenhower, and Nixon was on a goodwill tour of Latin American countries. My father was CIA station chief in uh, Montevideo, Uruguay. And, uh, and, uh, and Nixon came there and requested to, uh, to have lunch or dinner with my father. And, uh, and he did. So when Nixon, in the 70s, when he was president, and he wanted some things done that were illegal, dangerous, and covert, the first person that he requested to be uh, involved in this was Howard Hunt. We got to get Howard Hunt. He's he's a uh, he's a uh, he's he's trustworthy. The man knows his business. And there was a whole uh, there was a whole um, atmosphere about my father within the Nixon top circles of um, of this legendary E. Howard Hunt. Uh, that this was a man that was capable of of doing you know the most serious you know things such as executive action, black, wet, you know, wet jobs, murder, killing. Uh, he would have the people, the right people to do it and get away with it. And he was also a charismatic, uh, a man of the world, uh, a lover of wine and, and, and fine art. And, uh, and he could sit uh, at a, uh, at a uh, black tie uh, affair with uh, uh, dignitaries and come off like a, like a smooth-talking James Bond. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, and later that night, he could go down in the trenches and fight with the Cuban liberators, you know, and uh, and do the dirty work, you know. So he was uh, he was well known in, in circles as someone that, that that would be good to have on the team. So uh, and that was before the plumbers. This was for Nixon's desire to uh, bomb and burn the Brookings Institute, which Nixon felt had a dossier on uh, uh, that Castro had sent to the Democrats, uh, outlining the many CIA attempts that Nixon was involved in to kill Castro, to kill, the, to kill him. And uh, Nixon was just uh, uh, fervishly looking for this dossier. So my father broke into the Chilean embassy. They talked about burning down the Brookings Institute, uh, murdering Jack Anderson, who they felt uh, might have a copy in his home. Uh, there was a plot to uh, eliminate Hank Greenspun uh, in Las Vegas because they thought he might have a copy. The DNC was a target for the break-in because they thought there might be a copy in Larry O'Brien's safe. So, uh, wow. you know, Nixon was trying to cover his trail in the uh, 
uh, attempts to kill Castro because some of the same people involved in the uh, in in, uh, in, uh, in killing Castro were some of the same people that then turned their guns around and killed and and had something to do with killing Kennedy. If you're just tuning in, this is Saint John Hunt. He is the author of the new memoir. Dorothy, the murder of E. Howard Hunt's wife, Watergate's darkest secret. He was the eldest son. And with this book, so much is out there. You're you're talking about you blame Nixon for uh, the death of your mother, uh, the plane crash. Uh, You reveal so much information uh, about your family and what was happening. You were the one privy to that information. Uh, Let's talk about... uh, your mom, and and you kind of did already, of course, talking about the involvement, but why would Nixon want to kill her? Well, I think the uh, easiest way to explain that is um, uh, if you know what someone loves, then in, or, in order to control that person, you threaten or take away what they love, when they love what they love and cherish most, mm-hmm. rather, than, rather than eliminate the person themselves, which may seem... To, too obvious of a of a maneuver, uh, and certainly um, if they had to, they killed my mother on a standing on a street corner uh, by herself, you know, bam bam drive by, uh, the investigation would then focus on my mother. But you put her on a but she gets on a plane, <clears throat> and you take the plane out and some houses on the ground as well, killing innocent people with CIA calls collateral damage. Uh, then the investigation doesn't center on one single person, my mother. It, it's, it's, it's an investigation about the airplane crash. And that's a very classic and standard CIA method of diffusing attention from a hit that they want. They may only want to hit one person. And they, they just sacrifice the whole plane. Another. Exactly. They will easily take out an entire building of people, an entire boat or a ship or a plane of people. Uh, that this one person is on, and it will uh, it will successfully uh, uh, diffuse the investigation uh, and not center and not have it centered on one single person. Now, the reason that that plane <clears throat> was so important to take down is because my mother was on that plane with Michelle Clark, who was a CBS reporter. As a matter of fact, the first female African American uh, reporter uh, of any notoriety, and uh, she and my mother had arranged to hold a press conference. Uh, uh, within a, a day or so after arriving in Chicago, at, and at that press conference, my mother was going to reveal uh, everything she knew and had evidence against uh, Nixon because she felt that they they were treating my father, her husband, uh, very uh, unfairly, very poorly, and she just felt that they were just going to hang him out to dry, which, in fact, that's what they were going to do. They had promised him clemency. They had promised him uh, money to pay his lawyers and, and to take care of the defendant's lawyers and all this. The money just kept trickling less and less and less. And she was being followed. She'd go and pick up, uh, she, you know, I went with her to a, a phone booth in uh, Potomac, Maryland, about 10 minutes from our home out there. And uh, we should wait for the phone to ring. She had her 25 caliber pistol uh, in her lap. She'd wait for the phone to ring. She'd get out the phone booth. The phone would ring. She'd get out of the car. And it was spooky there. I, I felt doom. I mean, I felt danger in the air. And to pick up the phone and she, you know, nod, say a few things and then click, get back in the car, take me back to our home. And then she'd say, I have to go out alone by myself. And I was uh, so upset about this. I, mm-hmm. I begged her to let me come with her. And she'd go to uh, Greyhound bus station or the airport or, and uh, pick up uh, a key that was taped under a phone booth, a specified phone, phone booth. And the key would then correlate to a uh, you know, a storage box or a locker on the premises, which would be inside would be a large satchel or bag of cash. She would drive that back home and, 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 and we'd count it, you know. And one time it was so cute of her, she handed me a, a five a $5,000 packet of money. And I go, what's this for? And she goes, buy a van and get out of town. And I'm like, whoa, where, where would I go? She goes, go anywhere, just get out of town, take a trip around the country, take your girlfriend, and, and uh, you know, go for at least a month before, you know, while we get this business here sorted out. Yeah. That's when Watergate was really at its worst. This is when Watergate, you said when, when Watergate was at its worst? Yeah, we were surrounded. 
surrounded by reporters. Yeah. The FBI was following us. Our phones were bugged. Uh, my mother was being followed and tailed. Uh, um, surveillance on her was uh, 24-7 when she went and picked up these, these this money that she went. And then she'd fly and give it to the Cubans and the Liddy family and all this stuff. And she, she felt that her life was uh, in, in danger. And she must have known. Because on that flight, she took out a $250,000 insurance policy, which she had never done ever in her life. And she flew, was used to flying all over the world. She may have had the feeling that it's kind of a gut feeling that this may be a flight she would not be returning from. Wow. And she was involved in the JFK assassination case also. You mentioned that. I know that I mentioned it too. But did she have information that was not revealed until, or has it still not been revealed? She was only involved in the fact that, that she knew my father's involvement. I see. They they, they shared everything. I mean, my mother was, uh, uh, according to Dick Helms, uh, who was the director of CIA, he thought that Dorothy Hunt was a higher was on a higher level than uh, than E. Howard Hunt, and uh, he said, quoted in his in his dim recollection that Dorothy Hunt had been uh, uh, had definitely been a CIA operative, and and of course she was. She joined the uh, CIA before it was the CIA. She worked in uh, <clears throat> in the Bern, Switzerland, under Alan Dulles, who was one of the early uh, the chiefs of CIA. But at the time, he was the head of OSS uh, station in Bern, Switzerland. Bern, Switzerland was the center point for uh, for uh, uh, banking uh, during World War II in Europe. It was the uh, country that was not involved in World War II uh, because it, it held all the banking. Uh, you know, capabilities uh, for the Nazis who banked through the Swiss banks. And, uh, you know, the the, uh, the gold that they pulled from the teeth of the Jews and the money that they stole uh, uh, all went into Swiss bank accounts uh, uh, protected by the Swiss uh, uh, banking laws. And my mother's job uh, uh, while she was you know, in Bern was to track uh, Nazi gold loot artworks uh, uh, in, in and around Switzerland, but also throughout Europe, track them, find them, and then get a hold of them for the Treasury and the State Department. And then and then OSS took over mm. that. That was called Operation... Uh, uh, it was called so Operation... Mm, I can't remember now. So Safe Haven, that's what it was. Safe Operation Haven, Safe. okay. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I want to go back to something, not right now, uh, Operation 40 you were mentioning before. So your father yeah. was the one. Now, he did he he did hide evidence or crucial evidence in Watergate. Is, is that right? What was the, some of that stuff? And how did you find out? Or were you aware at the time? Well, um, some of the stuff that was at our house was, uh, well, the first thing I did for him was uh, I met him down in a bank, uh, savings loan or a bank in, in Georgetown, which is a little... Uh, a little area in in Washington D.C., and I, I met him uh, in the back room where the safety deposit boxes were, and uh, he pulled out a, a large envelope full of cash and told it to, told me to shove it down my pants in the back and put my sports coat over the back of it to take a long uh, rope home and uh, be mindful of anybody following me uh, <laughs> behind me. Uh, you know, I, this is all new to me because I'm not, you know, skilled in any of these things. I'm like a 17-year-old hippie with long hair. Mm. But I was the only one home that my dad could count on him. So I, I did whatever I, I, he asked. And uh, and then I, he destroyed um, a typewriter that I told you that had been used to forge the DM cables. And uh, we dumped the... Uh, I, I cleaned up uh, two suitcases of uh, uh, recording devices, black boxes, wiring things, uh, microphones, uh, Bugging equipment. Uh, I wiped them down uh, with uh, window cleaner, and uh, and we uh, threw those suitcases in the back of his uh, 1970 uh, Green Firebird, and drove out to the Potomac Locks, uh, the Potomac Canal Locks, and threw them in the water. Just got rid of them. And then within a few days, my mother came home from Europe, and then she took over uh, these kind of these kind of things. Mm-hmm. But. Um, you know his his uh, his um, information for Watergate, what he was threatening Nixon with, was all these other crimes that Nixon had uh, had uh, committed. Right. Not just the breaking in of the DNC, but the breaking in of the Chilean embassy, the breaking in of uh, Daniel Ellsberg's psychiatrist's office, uh, 
uh, you know, the House vote uh, in in Miami where the Democratic National Convention was going to be held, uh, luring Democrats into this House vote, dosing them with LSD, and filming their uh, their various escapades with high class hookers. That was one of Gordon Liddy's favorite uh, things to do. Um, you know, they, they just had they they disrupted the DNC uh, convention by uh, ruining the air conditioning. They figured if everybody was hot, huh. it would uh, it would spoil things. I mean, this was a multi-level uh, uh, plan to disrupt anything the Democrats were doing. They planned false information about uh, uh, Muskie, uh, causing him to actually break down in front of the press uh, on a snowy day up in New Hampshire, I think, and and weep, uh, and therefore eliminating him from the race. They uh, they sent my dad up to get the dirt on uh, Teddy Kennedy about Chappaquiddick. Uh, they sent him to Milwaukee to uh, break into Arthur Bremer's apartment, who, uh, who was the uh, uh, alleged uh, the uh, near assassin of George Wallace. He did shoot George Wallace and paralyze him, but he didn't successfully kill him. My dad's job was to break into the apartment while it was under police surveillance and plant pro-McGovern literature. <laughs> wow! I mean, these guys, these Nixon guys were. We're freaking nuts. Well, you know, um, it's interesting because it sounds like in so many ways it's a continuation. Make it look Democrats look bad. I mean, it's yeah. the same game plan. It, 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 yeah. It's unbelievable. Yeah, just... Oh, and God. my mother argued with my... My father promised that when he retired from the CIA in 1970, which in this case was a false retirement. In other words, uh, he publicly retired and he had the retirement... Uh, certificate in the frame on his wall and blah, blah, blah. Uh, a nice signed picture by Richard Helms, you know, Howard, you've done tremendous work, blah, blah, blah. But it was a false retirement. It was his second time he, he uh, falsely retired and went under deep cover. The first time was 1965 when he went to, he retired from the CIA and, he, and, he, and we all moved to Madrid, Spain. And uh, what he was doing in Madrid was he was continuing to organize and uh, and put into action the uh, the murderous attempts uh, against uh, foreign leaders, uh, including uh, Che Guevara and and, uh, and uh, Fidel Castro and others. Uh, and uh, and in 1970, he retired from the CIA, and and, and within uh, six months or so, found himself working uh, in the new in intelligence gathering unit uh, in the White House. But he was reporting directly back to Richard Helms, the director of CIA. On a, on, a, on a one-to-one basis. In other words, my father's memos and his, his weekly reports were not going to the normal channels. They were being delivered by my father to the director of CIA hand-to-hand. So he was still in CIA, and this gives rise to many, many theories about, well, the CIA was all over Watergate. You know, uh, it was a botched job. These guys could have done way better. What the hell was really going on? And uh, it, it's, it's, there's still a lot of mystery to that. Uh, certainly, um, Helms knew that um, if Nixon was caught, uh, if he was the ultimate person responsible for the Watergate break-ins, yet he did not actually authorize that specific entry, he would still be ultimately responsible as the president. He would then go into uh, cover-your-ass mode, and that's what Helms knew and counted on. Put something in front of Nixon, have it go wrong, and then watch Nixon cover his ass, lie, and cover, cover, cover. And that's the cover-up that got Nixon impeached, not the crime itself. Yeah. And that's what Helms do. Man, oh man. And you're keeping this in, trying to be normal to your friends, and you, these the secrets are shared with you. And you met you met, you met met Nixon yourself, haven't you? Did you, have, you had contact with Nixon, didn't you, as a kid? No, I, you know, I had one opportunity, my father... Uh, uh, our family was invited to a uh, some kind of a, a fundraiser event at the White House, and we were, we would be able to meet the president. But I was in my anti-Vietnam mode, and I had a black uh, armband and long yeah, hair. Yeah, I was. There was, um, no, there was no way I was going to yeah. shake hands with the president. I uh, <laughs> definitely hear you on that. I'm, I'm from the same generation <laughs> that you. Uh, yeah. Uh, you yeah, have such an interesting book. Such an, and not, well. First of all, if you're just tuning in, Dorothy. The Murder of E. Howard Hunt's Wife, Watergate's Darkest Secret, the name of the memoir by St. John Hunt, who is the oldest son of E. Howard Hunt. And you had, and by the way, let me give you his uh, website. He, he writes interesting little articles and op-eds. It's stjohnhunt.net. Spell out Saint, St. 
johnhunt.net. I read an op piece about uh, what we should do in fighting these uh, terrorists, what happened in there. And man, yeah. oh man, did you, that was so interesting, so interesting. Do you mind uh, going over that? Or do you want to take a break no, first or go ahead? Not at all. Yeah. It, it, was, it just occurred to me that uh, in, in, uh, in researching and understanding what my father was involved in with Operation 40, which was one of two different assassination teams uh, worldwide to, uh, to eliminate uh, people that disagreed with the American foreign policy, it seemed to me that... Uh, that that's exactly what we needed and would and need now in in uh, in combating ISIS. We can't fight ISIS with uh, with standard military intervention. We can't carpet bomb ISIS. We can't uh, uh, restrict their uh, trade. We can't put a trade embargo on them. We can't restrict their uh, you know their anything. I mean, these are these are individual small cells that that are, are doing these things. And what we need. As much as the as the, as the uh, Israelis did during the uh, uh, the Olympics, when the uh, the PLO the, the uh, Palestinians uh, uh, basically uh, held uh, the Israeli team uh, ransom, and then and ended up killing all of them uh, uh, when they were demanding the release of uh, fellow Palestinian prisoners. Um, you know the Israelis. There was no press about this. There was no. Uh, you know, books, movies written about this. These were guys that, a very small team that went around for years, killed each one of the persons, of the Palestinians involved in the murder of this uh, Olympic team, the Israeli Olympic team. And uh, it was done without fanfare, without notoriety, and it was done on a very personal level, saying, we did this. And that, and, you know, and, and that's what we need. We don't need a lot of fanfare. We don't need uh, drones you know, flying around, dropping bombs or whatever, killing innocent bystanders or collateral damage. We need a team to go out there and quietly over the next few years kill every single one of these people that are responsible for those heinous acts. And to be so trained and highly skilled at infiltrating and, and being believed yeah. to be sincere and they're accepted and, wow, what a team that is. Who does that yeah. kind of training, right? I thought, where are the assassins now when we need them? Where's Operation Jeez. 40 now when we need them? Yeah. Well, listen, you have a lot to say. Very interesting conversation. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, very good. It, with a minute or two that we have left here, is there any uh, interesting little tidbit that I didn't bring out that you think the audience needs to hear? Um, well, what the audience really needs to hear is that as far back as 1972 when my mother was killed, and even for uh, decades prior to that, the CIA and uh, and other uh, armed uh, uh, other parts of intelligence gathering units, say is Army intelligence, naval intelligence, that sort of thing, they have always been involved in the suppression of truth. They've always been involved in assassinations if it if it gets them what they want, and they care very little about collateral damage. They care very little about that they that they killed my mother to keep my father quiet, and the effect that it would have on the family's children. And I think this is this is going to be the point of my next book, which is going to be called Children of Assassins, that there is a deeply disturbing damage that's done to the children of these people that get involved with CIA or military intelligence and are uh, accused of being assassins. And, and how do the, how do the kids deal with it? To me. I dealt with it by substance abuse for 20-some-odd years. I finally came out of it, you know, in 2002. And, um, you know, it's a heavy burden to put on families. This idea that collateral damage is just something that is acceptable is not acceptable and should not be allowed to be accepted. Good so for you. I, yeah. Yeah. Wow. I'm trying to put my... <laughs> you can't do it. I'm putting myself in your shoes. I don't know how... Few, and your parents didn't even probably tell you everything. They probably just told you the stuff they had to tell you. Right. I never got the full story of the JFK assassination from my father, and uh, and I and I never got yeah. uh, my mother's full story either. But that's the other book, Bond of Secrecy, that I wrote, which details the last bed, deathbed confession of my father and how that came about. Bond of book Secrecy. Bond of Secrecy. Yep. And then I then I wrote Dorothy, and they make a great companion. You should always read Bond of Secrecy first, and then Dorothy, and it just fits together so nicely. You can get plenty of information on his website, stjohnhunt.net. And again, the new memoir about all of this, this is uh, just out. It's called Dorothy, 
the murder of E. Howard Hunt's wife, Watergate's Darkest Secret. Thank you, Saint, Alan. You're very welcome, St. John Hunt. It was great talking to you. Thanks for being on Wonderful the Alan Hanlon Show. Bye-bye. Right. Bye-bye.